Hello everyone and uh, welcome to this talk that's been organized by the Center of World Environmental History. Uh, we are very happy to have Juan Martinez Elia with us today. So um, some quick housekeeping before we begin. We are recording this meeting and after Juan's spoken, we will be, I'll stop the recording and we will welcome you to ask questions either via the chat or if you put your hand up, um, I will come to you in due course. So now I'd like to invite our director, Vanita de Modren, to introduce Juan. Um, thank you, uh, Mike, for organizing this um, talk. Um, it gives me great pleasure. It's an honor to have uh, Juan Martinez Alier here talking to us. Um, our relationship goes back quite a long way to 1999 when I first met Juan uh, along with my husband, my late husband, Richard Grove, um, and Rohan D'Souza was also here at Yale University. He was an inspiring figure then. He continues to inspire us all. In many ways, he is um, the messiah of environmentalism. Uh, he was already working on his classic book, The Environmentalism of the Poor then. Um, and of course, as we know, he has coined several interesting uh, new words uh, to explain uh, and talk about environmentalism, including uh, ecological distribution conflicts. He runs a website funded by the ERC called the EJOLT Atlas. Um, and, and despite his the wealth of his scholarship, he is an amazingly humble man uh, who's, who's mentored several young scholars. Um, just a quick uh, list through his books. Um, in 1971, he uh, produced laborers and landowners in Southern Spain. It was interesting to note that his early work was on hacienda plantations um, in Cuba and Peru. But of course, we know him much more for his work um, in 1997, a book which I still teach, Varieties of Environmentalism, his 2002 book, Environmentalism of the Poor, and more recently, his Handbook of Ecological Economics. So I invite uh, Juan uh, to talk today to us, the title of his paper, which is beautifully written and, and very clearly articulated and argued and which is available for all of you to look at um, circularity, entropy, ecological conflicts, and unburnable fuels. So thank you very much, Joan, for agreeing to talk to us. Thank you, Leo. So I, <clears throat> should I start now? Yes. And then what I'm going to, I, I'm not going to assume that you have read this very long paper, but so I am going to show a few slides and then <clears throat> you will, all of you understand what I'm talking about. Because the title might be a little bit difficult to understand, circularity, entropy, ecological conflicts and these uh, living fossil fuels in the ground slogan or idea. So what I'm going to do is to is to go through the slides. And the first slide is about showing the elders of environmental justice, meaning the elders of environmental conflicts. As you see, we have nearly 3,500 by now. And many, there is a big team doing this for the last eight years. And about 500 of those are related to fossil fuels. And of course, quite often means attempts to leave the fossil fuels in the ground, whether it's oil, coal, or gas. And the next one is, uh, the next slide is about the, the something that you all will probably know, or should know at least, which is how carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is increasing. When I started to, because I am an economist, so I didn't know anything about the environment as an economist for many years. 
uh, or whatever I, I had learned at the school, I had forgotten. But then, of course, in the 1970s and 80s, I started. And in, I remember that in 92, at the time of the Rio conference, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was 360 parts per million. And today, it's reaching 420 parts per million. And every year now is increasing one or two parts per million. And the pandemic is not going to have any effect on this because it has been too short. I mean, it has been terrible and it is being terrible in many places, especially now in India, but it has no great effect on the emissions of carbon dioxide, on, especially on the concentration that comes from the past emissions over the last uh, 200 years since the Industrial Revolution. So population is still increasing in the world, or is stopping the rate of growth of population. And because of this, is we can talk in the same talk about two different things. The local attempts to keep fossil fuels underground for local reasons or also climate change reasons. And at the same time, to see how this relates to the obligation we all have as humans or we, the rich humans have at least, we have the obligation to reduce our emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So the first slide now shows, <clears throat> the next slide shows uh, in, in how in India, quite recently, some young people, I don't know where this was taken, probably in Bangalore, uh, they are demonstrating, probably is a Friday, Fridays for Future demonstration. All my slides have the sources at the bottom, so you can check if this is available, as I hope will be the, the, the slides, and also the paper is available, so you can find the sources. And I want to focus on the person at the center of this slide, with this slogan, is a performative slogan, isn't it? It's like uh, saying, leave oil in the soil or leave coal in the hole. She's saying, fund farmers and not coal. So she's a well-known person because she was, I think, well, anyway, some of these people were arrested not long ago. Uh, and so the next one, please. This is from India. And the next one is not from India, it's from the Philippines. It's both a photograph taken from a, from a published article, an academic article by Dr. Talina in World Development. And also the source is the others again. I won't repeat time and again that the source is the others because all the slides, the source is the others, the iconography in the others. The others has a lot of words. We have explanations about each case, but we also have some photographs <clears throat> and some links to documentaries. So this is in Southern Philippines. Well, it's very clear. This demonstration is about several things, human rights against Duterte. Philippines is a very violent country against environmentalists and also against defenders of human rights in general. And this is in South Cotabato. And the coal in question is a few, a few uh, million tons of coal, not so few, quite a lot of tons of coal, which will be mined in open cast mining, in open pits, so destroying the, the agricultural fields and the vegetation in this. This has been stopped for the time being, but I don't know for how long it will be stopped. So here we have one first case in which we could count the coal which is going to be left under the ground and what this would mean in terms of carbon dioxide, which is not going to be produced by combustion. But in this particular case, the local people are not even mentioning climate change. They have enough with Duterte and the police and everything they have to cope with to worry about world climate change, about which 
they are not responsible in the least because they are poor people with little energy, exosomatic energy consumption. So the next slide, please. Because I haven't learned to do it myself. The next slide is also in the Philippines, Northern Philippines, near Manila. And there is a person, Gloria Capitan, who was killed because she was opposing not a coal fire power plant in this case, but just a deposit of coal in, or in order to then build a coal fire power plant. This was about five or six years ago. And is one of the many people actually in the Philippines who have been killed in this kind of, of encounters. In this case was a, a, a paid a killer who killed her. And she was a grandmother and the grandchildren went around when she was killed. And she's not the only grandmother that will appear in my presentation. So we have now two cases from the Philippines. The next two cases, please. The next two places are <clears throat> to the north of the Philippines in Japan. And this is, as you can see from the photograph, they are uh, middle class people, most of them. Uh, and this is in, in, yeah, in, in Yokosuka, which is in the Bay of Tokyo. And in Japan at present, after Fukushima in 2011, there is what some people call a coal renaissance, but it's not so big, but they are trying to build a few more coal-fired coal power plants, coal FPP. No, CFPP, coal fire power plant. And this one would be like 1000 megawatts. Remember this, coal fire power plant, 1000 megawatts, because we have other example. The 1000 megawatts of electrical power uh, produced with coal burning means approximately six or seven million tons of carbon dioxide. In this case, I'm not sure whether they have been able to stop it or they are still fighting in order to stop it. And the next one, please, is also in Japan. The next one and is in, in, in Chiba Prefecture and is called Soga. And also, if you, some of you might be able to read Japanese, but even those who are not, you can see down in the, in the in this photograph and to the right it says climate justice for all so the local people are complaining because of course they don't want the pollution from the coal power fire plant in their place but they are also struggling and very conscious that there is a global issue of climate change produced by the excessive amount of greenhouse gases and one of the main one well, the main one is carbon dioxide. So here we have local, as so often local protests linked to a global issue, which is a very important issue. And what they are asking is not to build this coal fire power plant. The next one, please. <clears throat> the next one is in, in, in Karnataka. And I put it quite recently, or we, in fact, we updated it because quite recently, a couple of years ago, they put this stone there uh, and the newspaper said a victory cast in the stone. After 10 years, because this happened 10 years ago in Chamalapura near Mysore in Karnataka, they stopped this coal fire power plant. Again, 1000 megawatts of power was foreseen. As you see from this uh, grandfather uh, child, these are not uh, the poorest people in India, is farmers, middle class, in this case, as a leader of this movement. But as we explain in the address, um, second hand, taken from local sources, uh, <clears throat> the leader was middle class, but many of the participants were farmers, peasants, who didn't want the whole area to be destroyed for a coal fire power plant to be built, isn't it? And there are so many cases <coughs> in India and elsewhere of peasants uh, in India, in Jharkhand, in the north 
against mining or also against coal power uh, fire plants like in Sompeta in Andhra Pradesh, there are some famous cases who are uh, local people, local farmers, peasants who think that the mining will be very bad and also building the power plant will be bad for them. Of course, we need electricity, some people would say, but they would say, well, but not here or not perhaps anywhere. The next one, please. So we have seen two cases from India. This is a very sad case because this happened about in October last year. And this is another grandmother, Fikile Natsangase in Kwajuro Natal in an anthracite uh, coal mine uh, from the Tendele company in Tsomkhere. And she was the local leader leader of a movement called explicitly environmental justice movement against open cast mining. And the mine is very near her home, what used to be her home. And she was also killed by some paid uh, killers. And also in this case with a grandson nearby when she was killed. And this, what I'm trying to, to explain to you on the side is that the the participants in these complaints are <clears throat> quite often relatively poor people, at least compared to the owners of the mines or the owners of the, of the power plants, isn't it? Uh, they are, they are local, she's a local woman, uh, but uh, of different, different, not only different gender, different social class to some extent, can be uh, religious participants, can be uh, sometimes trade unionists, uh, not so often. So the class analysis, if you want, of these environmental movements is something that is still a very open question. And this is what we can do a lot with this, with the others in which we have so many examples. But also I want to call your attention to herself as a person who was alive uh, six months ago or nine months ago, and now she was really killed. I don't know whether she would say that she was an environmentalist, probably because her movement was called Environmental Justice Movement, the local one. The next one. The next one is about the same case, is a commemoration in, 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 in Nia in Johannesburg, I think not far from the place where she was killed. And what I want you to, <clears throat> to see is that at the, at the bottom to the right, there is a woman with a poster saying, keep coal in the hole. Another saying, coal kills. But this keep coal in the hole is something, I don't know who invented this, but it came after Nimo Basi and other people in the Niger Delta in Nigeria had invented uh, the slogan of the little verse, keep oil in the soil. And after in Ecuador also, together with Nigeria, Oil Watch had been formed in 1997. And the slogan from the beginning was this, keep oil in the soil, keep coal in the hole, and keep gas also underground. And this because of local reasons, like in this case, because the, the coal mine was really eating away her own fields and her own home of other community, but also because of uh, global reasons. Next one, please. This is in, I didn't know very much about one year ago about this protest in Kuzbas in Russia in Kumerovo Oblast. And this is one case which I wanted to show to you in which you the, the, all the village has put the same, the same posters. There is no mention, as far as we know, of climate change there. It's just about local issues because an open cast coal mine is going to eat up the village. And in this case, uh, this is interesting because uh, while well, coal, uh, Russia, like South Africa, like India, they're still increasing the production of coal. Coal increased in the world over seven times the extraction 
in the 20th century. And in the 21st century, it has been increasing still. I think coal extraction is going to stop more or less, not to stop, the increase is going to stop, but it has increased very much in the last 120 years. Not so much as oil, not so much as gas, but it has increased a lot, and particularly in China, but also now in India. There is a recent paper by Brototti Roy and Anke Shaf Arcik, which is called like this, it's called uh, Transition, India's Transition to Coal, not away from coal, to coal, isn't it? And we don't know whether what will happen in China, whether perhaps coal uh, extraction has peaked, and in Russia is still increasing. So the next one, please. And this one that people here, especially on aluminum, I don't know whether Felix Padel is listening and Samarendra Das are listening because I met them many years ago in Odisha when they were writing the book. Well, the book took a long time to write, which is this book called Out of This Earth, which is about aluminum struggles, mainly in India, but also around the world. And this is one case like this, but why I'm talking about aluminum now? Because in Jamaica, which is a place where there is bauxite, there is uh, at least one plan to make a big uh, coal fire power plant with Chinese money in order for smelting the bauxite and the alumina to make aluminum. Aluminum you take from the earth, not in the form of aluminum, but in the form of bauxite. This is transformed into aluminum and produces a toxic waste called red mud. Then you have aluminum with a lot of electricity. And then finally you have perhaps aluminum cans. If you take an aluminum can, perhaps this is going to be recycled, isn't it? But all the entropy has already happened. The bauxite has been taken from the soil with a lot of energy and then producing this very toxic waste, about one third of this, or one half is red mud. Then all this is, is, is goes to a factories for the smelting with a lot, as I say, of electricity. In this case, would be coal, megawatts from coal. Therefore, all this is spent, the coal, and it's entropy. Entropy means energy, dissipated energy. So the aluminum is lost. You have to fetch new bauxite, although a little bit perhaps is recycled. And all the energy is dissipated in this process, isn't it? So this is what I mean in saying that the economy is not circular. The economy is entropic, as I will explain again at the end. In this case, is one follows the case, because of the complaints linking local reasons with climate change, instead of a coal-fired power plant, it seems they're going to make a natural gas power plant, which by kilowatt hour produces a little bit less of carbon dioxide, but it also produces carbon dioxide, of course, and some nitrogen and so on, the natural gas. And it's also an exhaustible stock of photosynthesis from the distant past, which is going to be burned and burned forever. Again, this gas, as you can obviously know, understand, cannot be used twice, isn't it? The coal cannot be used twice and the oil cannot be used twice. Or oh, this is dissipated energy. Dissipated energy is the same thing as saying that this is entropy and is not a circular economy. The next one, please. The next two or three ones are from Argentina, from the south, from Patagonia. And they are about oil, but also about gas. These are Mapuche demonstrating in, in, in Neuquén against Chevron, against fracking of oil and gas. And the next one is the same thing, is the local complaints against Chevron, fuera Chevron, no al fracking. <clears throat> Chevron, together with Shell, have a big place in a talk like this, because Chevron 
in fact, Texacon, which was absorbed by Chevron in Ecuador, and Shell in the Niger Delta in Nigeria, are the two companies who inspired movements in Ecuador, one, Acción Ecológica, and other movements, and then in what's called ERA in Nigeria, um, Environmental Rights Action, in Nigeria, with Nimo Basi and Godwin Ojo and other people, and the Ogoni in Nigeria, and the Jaws in the Niger Delta, with many people being killed in, in, in all this uh, disaster in the Niger Delta. When they got together in 95, these groups, and they founded Oil Watch, this is when the, the slogan, leave all in the soil was first put in public, didn't they? And in 90, from 97 on, this was, uh, but I'm talking here about Argentina and Chevron in Argentina, but Chevron in Ecuador is, was a disaster and is in the origin of a lot of the resistance against fossil fuels from, from the ground up, isn't it? From the bottom up, these movements. Next one, please. The next one is also in Argentina and it shows in Allen a platform which has this name, Fernandez Oro, which is about fracking in also in Patagonia. I put this because I, I haven't been there myself, but it's a, a part, as you see, it doesn't rain very much, but when there is irrigation, it's an area for fruit growing. And Maristela Svampa, a political ecology from Argentina, well known because she's behind, one of the people behind this idea in Latin America against extractivism as a system. So it's an extractivist political ecology with very good books and writings. One of her books is about this because she comes from this area and it's a very good book. I don't think it's been translated. And it's also a very sad book explaining how her own family, she, she has a doctorate in Paris and she's a university professor, but then she remembered that her family comes from this area and they were fruit growers and now they are being expelled by the fracking, the gas fracking from these companies. So the next one, please. The next one is very far from Argentina to the top in Norway, in the Lofoten Islands, which are famous because of the codfish is a very rich area in terms of biodiversity. Because of course, although the, the fossil fuel economy is entropic and our industrial economy is entropic, life on earth is entropic in a way, but it's also anti-entropic because the sun falls every day and therefore there is life in, on the planet earth and as Schrodinger and, and many other authors explain in the early 19th century, we can look at life on Earth as an anti or negentropic phenomenon. But the industrial economy doesn't work, doesn't work by sun energy falling today, by the photosynthesis of today. In part, it works like this. If you everything we eat has been produced by current photosynthesis, isn't it? But we are using stocks of photosynthesis, dead photosynthesis from millions of years ago in the form of coal, gas, and oil. We take it from, the, from, the, from under the sea or from under the ground, and we burn it and dissipate it. And in this case, in the Lofoten Islands, on the surface, there is a very rich fishery of codfish and probably many other fishes which we are not supposed to eat or we don't eat. Uh, so it's a very rich area biologically, although it doesn't look in the photograph, one doesn't see this. One sees people complaining against oil extraction and gas extraction. And in the Lofoten Island, they managed to stop it. And could they stop it was about like uh, 1,000 million or a bit, a bit more, 1,000 million barrels of oil that would be under, underneath the sea and that people, the uh, corporations wanted to take out. This is 
in the order of magnitude to what the Yasuni ITT proposal in Ecuador wanted to do. In that case in Ecuador, we talked, I was involved in this, we talked about 850 million barrels of oil. To tell the truth, nobody knew for sure because they are under, under the ground, so we don't know how many there are, but this was the estimate. It's good to remember now that if you take one million barrels of oil per day, one million barrels of oil per day from anywhere in the world, after one year, you have taken 50 million tons of oil. So Yasuni in three years would have been 50 million tons of oil with one million barrels of oil every day. Of course, they would take less than this. So 50 million, remember this, 50 million tons of oil. And remember the 1,000 megawatts of a coal fire power plant. These are the only two figures you have to remember. 50 million tons of oil, 50 million tons of oil, and 1,000 megawatts of power from a coal power power station. The next one, please. This was a success. Lofoten was a success, as it seems, might be a success with President Biden, with some help from the local people, to tell the truth. Some help, some help from his people, from, from, from his friends, I mean, from indigenous friends who in the last 10 years, 15 years, have been complaining in freezing cold sometimes against the XL Keystone uh, pipeline coming from Canada and going down to the Gulf of Mexico through these places, Dakota and, and Missouri, Kansas, and so on. And then the other, the other one, the Dakota uh, pipeline, isn't it? The Dakota pipeline and the XL Keystone pipelines. Here you have a photograph of the pipelines or scheme of the pipelines taken from CNN without permission to tell the truth, but uh, um, which more or less gives to you the, the location of these things. And so the next one, please. The next one is a demonstration in Lincoln, which is the capital of Nebraska, in, I think, uh, some years ago, complaining against the Keystone XL pipeline. In fact, some part has been built already and some part is going to be stopped, it seems, because Biden had promised to stop it. But it promised because there has been all these local complaints, isn't it? First you have local complaints and then sometimes policies change at the state level, sometimes, not always by far. So what is important, I think, is the local movements. And in this case, if you see the slogan, protect our land, protect our water, and protect our climate, but not because the pipeline is bad for the local climate, but because the oil once born will produce carbon dioxide and they are thinking of global climate in this case. Next one. And this is in Canada, but it's also about pipelines. And this is the Kinder Morgan pipeline coming also from the Alberta tar sands, which are really a very nasty kind of stuff because you have to put a lot of energy to take a little bit more in the form of, of heavy oil. And this would be piped to the West to export to China, I suppose, from the Pacific uh, harbors. Very much there is also one other case, which I, I'm not going to show, in the US, which is in Oakland, near next to Berkeley in California, in which people, I think, have stopped also an idea of bringing oil from, from inside the US, pipelines, and then have a harbor terminal for exporting coal in this case. Not, so it's not pipelines, lorries with coal of trains, and they have stopped the coal from Auckland to be exported. So in this case, it's oil, so it would come with pipeline to the Vancouver or to the ports in the west coast of Canada for export. 
And this one is very clear what they say. This is from 2014, some years ago. And there is still under discussion, as far as you know, this Kinder Morgan, Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline, which of course is going to be built on stolen indigenous land, isn't it? So the next one. So these pipelines I have shown, they are of the order Dakota and, 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 and the uh, EX, XL Keystone, and this one, Kingdom of, of the order of 400,000 or half a million, half a million barrels of oil per day. This is what they would transport. They are quite big pipelines. And so half a million barrels of oil per day means 25 million of tons per year, no? 25 million, which would more or less, you have to multiply by three and you will get the tons of carbon dioxide, which are avoided eventually when this oil is going to be burned by stopping the pipelines. And this is quite far from Canada and quite far from Argentina, not so far from Sussex and not far at all from Barcelona, which is in South Italy. South Italy, and I like it a lot, apart from because I find it funny, this, this uh, gnome uh, trying to stop a gas pipeline, which is called, notice the name, it's called the Trans-Anatolian Pipeline, coming from Central Asia, going through Turkey, going through Greece, coming through South Italy, and going to Northern Europe or to the rest of Europe because in Europe, in the continent of Europe, we live a lot from imported gas from Northern Africa. In Northern Europe now, exported probably from, from Russia. And then this also from Central Asia through the Trans-Anatolian uh, pipeline. And these people in Puglia, they have lost, I think, the battle they wanted to stop this pipeline going through their own landscape and beaches and so on. And the slogan in Italian says, ne qui, ne qui, ne uh, altro. Here is in the chat, I see Roberto Cantoni, who is an expert, says it's not trans-Anatolian, it's trans-Asiatic. But it's true that one part of it, as far as I have read, goes through Anatolia in Turkey, isn't it? Or we can, uh, uh, yes, according to Roberto Cantoni, goes through Anatolia. Well, yeah, Anatolia is very far from Puglia, isn't it? And, and it's a very long pipeline. The slogan, which I like very much, is ne qui ne altrove, which is exactly what in the US they would say, some people would say, all this cases I am showing, they are NIMBY cases, not in my backyard. Well, totally untrue, isn't it? Because when the slogan says, we are caring for the land, the water, and the global climate, the global climate is not, not in my backyard, no? It's everybody's backyard. And this translated into Italian is ne qui ne altrove. If there are any Catalans in the audience, in Catalan, this is ni aquí, ni anlloc, which I find very economically, economical as well. Ni aquí, ni anlloc means not here and not anywhere, not in anyone's backyard. So this is part of the global environmental justice movement, one could say, assuming that it exists, but is composed of this uh, myriad of local examples in this particular talk only related to gas, oil, and coal. The next one, please. The next one is at all not a matter of joking because this is something that is happening right now, isn't it? In Northern Mozambique, in Cabo Delgado, with because of several international companies, including any, including uh, Exxon, but also 
now Total from France. Total is also involved in Myanmar 10, 15 years ago already with the Yadana pipeline from, from Myanmar to Thailand. And Total now in Myanmar with the military junta, they have said we are politically impartial. We are continue with gas exports and gas production that despite the fact that the government now are uh, very bloody kind of generals. So this Total in France. Total in Mozambique, eh? we don't know what we'll do. Because quite recently, as you might have probably read, this kind of bunker, no? Bunker extractivism of about 7,000 hectares, no? 17,000 acres, 10,000 hectares, no? which is 70 square kilometers, is that the perimeter would have 25 kilometers, is like a, an enclave, or is supposed to be like an enclave. There is land available for ensure development. The LNG park is not a green park at all. LNG means li liquid natural gas. So you take the gas from the sea, you, you uh, cool it a lot, cooled very much, it becomes liquid, and then you can export it as liquid. The amount of gas is very large in that area. Total has a plan for about $20 billion investment and about 50 million tons of gas, liquid gas every year. 50 million tons every year for quite a few years. This would be equivalent to 60 million tons of oil per year. 60 million tons per year is uh, what is it? Is uh, almost three times as much as Ecuador per, per year, isn't it? In terms of oil, but this is gas to for export, of course, export to China, export to 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 Europe. And what happens is that part of the local people were displaced from here fishermen and, and agriculturalists, uh, an airstrip has been built, and uh, Cabo Delgado has half the population is of Islamic origin, as so often in East Africa, from Kenya, Tanzania, down to northern Mozambique, there are quite often Islamic communities, and some of the Islamic communities displaced have taken to arms, and there is going to be, a, there was a fight, strong fight recently with many hundreds of people killed and a big war I think is being prepared there between say Western civilization and Islamic insurrectionists, isn't it? But the motive of this is gas, uh, entropic gas, because gas is taken from the sea, is liquefied, is exported, is burned and the energy dissipates. So that is something that I wrote something with Patrick Bond about it a few weeks ago, just a few pages, and it's worth following what will happen because it's quite likely to be something awful that is going to happen there. The next one, please. The three or four remaining ones are more theoretical and it's about, well, these questions. Why so many LFFU protests? LFFU protest is a more modern way of saying leave oil in the soil, leave coal in the hole, leave fossil fuels underground. This is what Naomi Klein in her book, very good book of 1914 called Blockeria. Because she said, I have found people in Canada and in, and she's from Canada and in the US blockading these pipelines, the Dakota pipeline, the, no, the Keystone pipeline, the Kinder Morgan pipeline. And they themselves, the people involved in these com complaints, they said, we are in movement called blockadia. At least that's what she says in her book, isn't it? She probably improves a little bit the, the, the rhetoric the local rhetoric, but I think blockadia is a good thing to use. And we have used it in our own, in our own research 
Blockadia. We have a Blockadia map already for three or four years ago, which I am going to, <clears throat> to show. But we can ask clearly, and this is a genuine question, whether these protests are always geared to avoid climate change. And the answer is no. For instance, in India, there are many complaints against open cast coal mining in tribal, in Adivasi areas, in which people would use forest rights as a legal instrument, or they would complain just because the land belongs to them, isn't it? And they would most probably not talk about global climate change at all. And, and there are many cases like this. The cases I showed, more or less half and half, or perhaps two thirds are related to climate change because I chose them like this, but one third are not related to climate change yet at least. People talk about extraction and dissipation of energy, uh, talk against it without, for local reasons, not because of climate change, but both things can go together. And then when they go together, this movement became what Schwinger called a few years ago, and global movements, global, global, and local, global, isn't it? So the protests take place at the extraction frontiers and also the waste disposal frontiers when they are about carbon dioxide or nitrogen or particulates. For instance, particulates coming from coal fire power plants in Kampur, in, in, in North India, for instance, or, or near to Delhi, people complain against the particulate matter, isn't it? It goes to the lungs and they get ill. So these are, this is waste, waste disposal frontiers. Carbon dioxide in the world is also a waste disposal because we are producing too much. But quite often they are at the extraction frontiers and the extraction frontiers keep moving because since energy is dissipated and materials are not used so much and also get lost, the extraction is moving, moving, moving to more remote frontiers. Could be the Arctic, could be the Amazon, could be Cabo Delgado in Mozambique. Even a non-growing economy, even a non-growing industrial economy would have to move all the time towards these extraction frontiers because the energy from last year, the fossil energy has already been dissipated and lost. If the economy grows as it is again growing now in 2021, we'll do in 2022, then even more so. So that's the link between a non-circular view of the economy, a realistic entropic view of the economy. And I remember now that it's 50 years since Georgescu Reagan published this book called The Entropy Law, The Entropy Law and the Economic Process exactly talking not about conflicts because he didn't talk about conflicts, but he already put the, the basic for ecological economics. So the industrial economy is not circular, it is entropic. And I give here some numbers from Willy Haas and many other people are doing these calculations. It is just a coincidence that in the last few years we are taking about 100 gram number gigatons, giga, giga means thousand million tons per year of materials. If you divide 100 gigatons into 7 billion people in the world, 7.5, so it's like 13 tons per person per year that we are using and most of it just dissipating because four or five tons are going to be fossil fuels. Then biomass, with the biomass, or a lot of the biomass is wood that would burn or goes to feed the animals that we eat. Most, a lot of it goes, soybeans and, and so on. Or a lot is biomass for fuels, ethanol, biodiesel. We burn it and it's gone. So of these 100 gigatons, per capita would be 13 tons. Well, I am probably, not this year because I'm not traveling, but in my life in the last 40 years, I have probably been at, at, at 15 tons per capita of myself per year or more. 
and many people are living at one ton of materials per capita per year. Because what do they do? They eat a little bit. We all more or less eat one kilogram per day. And they have a clothes, they have a little house, they burn a little wood for cooking or dunk perhaps, and that's all, isn't it? So there is a big difference and I want to emphasize this difference. But remember this, of the 100 gigatons per year, less than 10 tons are recycled. And this is the circular economy gap that people are talking a lot, talking a lot now. It's not a gap, it's not like minding the gap in the London Metro, just a step gap. It's like an abyss. It's uh, just it's an enormous gap. It's a 90% gap, isn't it? Between what we recycle and what we use as fresh materials and empty. And this is why there are these fights of the commodity extraction frontiers. The next one. Now, in terms of climate change and carbon dioxide, we are producing, humans are producing between a lot the rich and a little bit the poor. So if everybody was producing carbon dioxide as the average Indian citizen from India are doing, there would be no climate change. So this comes from the expenditure of the rich, including those from India, but there are not so many. Uh, but by country, this comes from the industrial revolution and from the from from what goes came from the industrial revolution onwards. These 40 billion tons of CO2 per year should be reduced by half, so that the oceans and the new vegetation would be able to absorb it about 20 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year without increasing the uh, concentration in the atmosphere that I showed at the beginning were reaching already uh, 420 parts per million, going to 250 before uh, the year uh, 2050. It's increasing very fast. So we have to reduce from 40 billion tons, half. Uh, some of it comes from land use changes. So there are 35 billion coming from burning the fossil fuels. Well, I have made some calculations which I have not published and I am not going to publish soon because this is, has to be better done. But the successful attempts to leave fossil fuels underground or equivalently, the successful efforts for blockaria or equivalently, or these are the different names for the same thing, the yazunization or organization, because I'm talking in Nigerian language here, because it was the Ogoni and the Jaws who had the initial idea of leaving oil under the soil. Uh, all these attempts put together perhaps amount not to 20 billion that we should reduce, but perhaps to 10, 5 billion tons. Each carbon, sorry, each coal fire power plant of 1000 megawatts, and we have seen three or four during the talk stopped. Each one of them means like six or seven million tons of carbon dioxide less. So we would have like 100 or 200 or 300 coal fire power plants. There are 2000 in the world stopped to make any real difference, but this might happen. Why not? This might happen that as people complain for local reasons and they are reinforced by the climate change debate, all these kind of demonstrations we have seen in Philippines and in, in Japan, of course, and in other places in Southern Italy against fossil fuels uh, go further. So this is more or less the end. If you can show the next one, please. The next one is just uh, to make clear that we are not, some people in the audience are working on this, I know, and we are not new to this because we have been publishing uh, things like a nature report already 2003, which we call Yasunization because the Yasuni plan was still alive. 
until Korea, President Korea killed it in 2003 or four. And this is a report of 200 pages with many examples around the world uh, with many authors. Lea Tempa is one, but there are like 20 authors of this EJOL report number 13, which is in the web. Then we did, or I didn't, but some younger people in the team in Barcelona did this Blockedia map, which is in the, in the web with about 70 or 80 examples. This is being used by some people around the world, sometimes uh, with uh, the proper acknowledgement, sometimes not, because of course they collected all these cases and there are in the others, so it's very easy to just go to the others, cut and paste, and then produce another paper. Well, they are welcome, but they should quote where they are taking this. And this Blockedia map, I think it was, young people doing this very enthusiastically. And this has produced an article, which is number three, which is only in Spanish so far. So it's like, it would not exist in fact, internationally, but it's a good article, I think short article based on the Blockedia map. And going back to Arrhenius and, and the discovery of the greenhouse effect 130 years ago, because all these things could be, could have been discussed already. 130 years ago. Number four is a recent article, totally academic, totally in English, I mean, with all the credentials, with many authors, which published in Environmental Research Letters, with three or 400 cases of a systematic mapping of protests against fossil fuels, but also, as somebody was asking in the chat, also against windmills, and also sometimes against solar energy for different reasons. Windmills because they occupy a lot of land or because sometimes of the materials for, for batteries like lithium and so on. But I am not talking about opposition to renewable energy, so to speak. Here I am talking only about opposition to fossil fuels, which is going on because the bulk of the energy the industrial system uses in the world is fossil fuels, more and more. I'm not joking when they say that India is in a transition to coal, is also in a transition to, fossil, to solar energy and to wind energy, everything goes up, but coal goes up, gas goes up and oil goes up. The number fifth is a very recent doctoral thesis, which is going to be available, in which one of the chart, chapters is about more than 60 cases of opposition to coal in India, but also elsewhere, some with climate change connotations, some not. And the last one is the paper I am giving right here now, which is not yet published and will be published soon, I hope, in local environment. And the last one, this is the last one, short, isn't it? So thank you very much for listening and I hope there is time for, for discussion. Thank you, Juan. Um, so I can see there are a lot of questions already in the chat, uh, but before going over to those, um, I want to introduce Malva Kagupta and Rohan D'Souza to kick off the conversation. So Malvika, do you want to go first? Okay, uh, thanks very much. I'm Malvika Gupta. It's, it's, uh, I don't know how to follow this kind of expansive uh, presentation and this paper which has such a wide scope, which uh, to my mind in a sense is synthesizing all of Joan's life's work uh, and his, contrib his massive contributions to ecological economics and political ecology and not being trained in either uh, political ecology or <laughs> nor ecological economics. I feel uh, a little bit, uh, I feel on weak ground commenting on this. But uh, anyway, the way I come into this is uh, from uh, an anthropological perspective and I'm doing my diesel uh, right now. And I've been looking at the, before starting the DFIL, I've been looking at the nexus between extractivism and uh, education in India and Ecuador. 
uh, and how that sort of leads to flattening of multiple epistemologies and different ways of living and so on. And currently, uh, the way I approach Joanne's work is from my current DFIL work, which is looking at the 2008 constitutional reforms uh, in Ecuador, which led to Ecuador declaring itself as a plurinational intercultural state, recognizing rights of nature. And uh, understanding, making sense of that, I realized Joanne's massive contribution, uh, not only as a scholar, but really as a scholar activist, working with uh, various people like Alberto Acosta, Fander Falconi, uh, Maria F Fernanda Espinosa in Ecuador, as well as organizations like Acción Ecológica, push forward the discourse on rights of nature and to help us look at nature in a different paradigm. Uh, and this combined with the Yasuni Initiative, which Joan writes a lot about in the paper, as well as the Sarayaku uh, uh, important case in Ecuador. So from this background, I feel that in this paper, Joan really kind of sets out the problem uh, and ends with by giving us an alternative in terms of the potential of the global justice, uh, global environmental justice movement. In terms of setting out the problem, what I really liked about uh, the paper was the fact that he looks at the extraction complex as a whole, although the focus in this paper is on fossil fuels, so coal, oil, and gas, uh, he looks at the extraction complex as a whole and the, and the whole extractive cycle from the extraction of the physical materials to their transportation to uh, at the point where it becomes waste. So that's one aspect of it. And the other is along with the fossil fuels, uh, an argument which is put forward a lot is we can substitute fossil fuels by uh, renewable energy. So with solar panels, windmill, um, hydropower and so on. And Joan, although he doesn't go into it deeply in this paper, he shows that even that, uh, that idea of renewable energy is also dependent on extraction and is very much enmeshed in the cycle of extraction. And then the third aspect of it uh, is, the, is his kind of slight critique, a very implicit critique of uh, technological optimism, where uh, electric cars uh, are, are, are suggested, suggested as alternatives or technology in other ways uh, is suggested as alternatives. Uh, for example, Apple uh, saying that aluminum, uh, the, the aluminum that we use for our uh, laptops is uh, recycled aluminum. And John very persuasively shows how this industrial economy is not circular, even though that's what the European Union in Brussels would like us to believe, or uh, China would like us to believe, or Apple would like us to believe. But so he, he makes a very persuasive argument uh, for the industrial economy not being uh, circular and, and how it's entropic and how we need to look at this complex as a whole in, and also see the problems of looking at technology as a solution everything and how that's dependent on extraction of rare earth minerals and so on and as this extraction complex goes forward as he as he uh, he already discussed it it leads to pushing uh, uh, pushing forth the commodity frontiers uh, and uh, in which he talks about two aspects one is of pushing of the commodity frontiers in terms of commodity expansion uh, through spatial expansion, so occupying more land, more land grabbing and so on, as well as commodity deepening. So again, the aspect of technology comes in where uh, one is using different kinds of technology to extract uh, uh, any commodity more deeply. So instead of uh, subterranean mining, you would have open past mining, so on, and other technology as Chevron, claim to use uh, and claims to use still now in uh, in Ecuador. And so this pushing of the extraction commodity frontiers automatically leads to 
to, to a rise in ecological conflicts. And that's again, John's massive contribution uh, from political ecology, how political ecology helps us make sense of these conflicts, uh, which basically foreground the incommensurability of values. And I here, I think, uh, understanding this whole as the evaluation struggle, I find my own supervisors, Laura Rival's work very helpful and a, an important paper that she wrote uh, 10 years ago called Old and New Values of Petroleum. So to my mind, I think we can understand this, uh, these evaluation struggles in two ways. One is the, uh, the incommensurability of values. So for example, in Niamgiri or in, uh, in Orissa or in uh, the current struggle in Chhattisgarh around the Nandraj uh, mountain, uh, which Adani is due to mine, where, where uh, communities get together and they say, this is, this is a sacred mountain and this cannot be touched. So there are, there's an incommensurability there. The other sort of aspect of the valuation of valuation struggles would be the Yasuni case, where you use the metric of money to uh, to see how much one what the value of one barrel of oil is uh, in comparison to value of storing oil in the ground and storing carbon in the ground. So I think again that's a, that's a uh, that's, a, that's the sort of logical next step of the expansion of commodity frontiers, these ecological uh, conflicts coming to surface. And uh, from there comes the alternative, which Juan ends uh, his paper with, which are these environmental justice movements and the leave fossil fuels in the, uh, in the ground movement, whether coal, uh, leave coal in the hole or oil in the soil kind of movements, which we have to take very seriously because again, going back to Ecuador, if one looks at the Yasuni case and the Sarayaku case, one sees that uh, the Yasuni case was a movement before it was uh, it was taken up by the state uh, as as a state uh, program. While in the Sarayaku case, we see it much more as an independent movement of the people united without uh, uh, without without any relation with the state. Uh, so I think uh, in terms of ending, I would say some of the questions this raises for us is then how do, moving ahead, how do we think within the state as in the case of Ecuador using rights of nature, thinking of the Yasuni initiative, and how do we think beyond uh, and above the state? And the second aspect is how do we rethink uh, the norms and categories that we take for granted, such as even of nature. So I, the other thing which I really like about uh, Johan's paper is that how he draws upon political ecology, ecological economics, uh, environmental and economic history to make his argument. And I feel uh, another valuable addition here could be ecological and economic anthropology, which can help us, uh, economic anthropology can help us make sense of these valuation struggles better. And ecological anthropology can help us make a uh, sense of the multiple relations that exist between human beings and nature. And nature is not, for instance, in, in uh, the case of the Amazon, for a lot of Amazon uh, Amazonian communities as the work of Philippe de Scola shows, Nature doesn't exist out there as, as an independent entity. And, uh, uh, and in the case of Kichwa philosophy, which I'm kind of trying to understand a lot more, uh, one central idea is that all living beings are interrelated. So human beings are interrelated with plants and animals and minerals as living beings and do not have a subject object relationship, but have a subject subject relationship. So how do we kind of uh, expand our uh, uh, our understanding. How do we expand the frontiers of of our understanding with the help of ecological and economic anthropology? I'll end there. Uh, I've said more than I should have. And fantastic. Thank you. Huge thank you, Joan, as always. So I'm just going to be super brief. Uh, uh, I wish I'd spoken first because Malvika has layered this now with uh, far more. Uh, questions and directed us to larger complications in philosophy. So I, I'm just going to shut her comments down and just concentrate on Juan. Um, first of all, I, I must also say that I'm really unhappy that this is on Zoom 
this is a kind of presentation and paper you would want to end with a dinner or a drink and a big fight and a squabble that goes beyond the conference room <laughs> yeah so it's very very sad that we have to do this on this very uh, limited kind of uh, framework of uh, technology but anyway that aside uh, juan you know uh, i'm just going to pick a bone with you uh, because malvika is sort of you know laid out that the complexity of the terrain um you know uh when i read uh, i think uh, uh, uh naomi klein's book uh, uh, this changes everything that whole section on blockadia really got a lot of attention um and i think she drew upon a lot of your mapping uh, that uh, looked at all these conflicts now blockadia is different from a lot of literature that worked on resource curse the resource curse literature was the politics of plenty you know there's oil coming out and it's a distribution problem that you know when this resource when this uh, sort of uh, uh, wealth is coming out the people who are local are just not getting their share so uh, distribution conflicts uh, really was what uh, defined uh, the resource curse now suddenly you get blockadia where people are not talking distribution they are talking about how do you value something that's kept back in the soil yeah so conceptually these are two very different frameworks and i wish you could have put that in perspective because uh <laughs> in the distribution framework uh, distribution uh, resource curse conflict and distribution it's very simple for us to say okay uh people are being cheated local communities are not getting uh, the benefits from an extraction of oil or gas or whatever that it was that they were in i mean the, the, the locality really uh the people of the locality are not getting their just uh, uh benefits from having previously sat on that land for whatever reason yeah so uh the distribution con con uh, conflicts was something that political economy was very very good in terms of its methodologies and its frameworks now blockadia is not not about distribution it's really making a case for why you should not generate wealth and you have to actually make a case by saying something is more valuable that is not that is left untouched rather than uh uh Uh, value created by extraction yeah and i didn't quite get in your paper where is that value coming is it going to be an economic value in which case you're going to say climate change uh has these many impacts and these many consequences so it's more valuable in terms of the consequent impacts to keep it under the ground that's one argument the second is a moral argument uh which you seem to have been making that these local communities don't want to be shoved aside uh they're not bothered about whether they will make profits from it or not but uh that in the long run of things uh they will be saving the planet by preventing um carbon uh, from emitted into the atmosphere so you are saying small communities who have potentially uh the possibility of getting wealthy will take a hard moral decision to save the planet i really don't know how that is going to be politically understood are we going to ask communities that please sacrifice your wealth of the present to save the planet of the future and all we can promise you is that um we are very happy with what you're doing right so i don't see where blockadia actually can organize because it is really at some level asking people to just stay where they are right um so i didn't quite get how you are trying to unite all these uh, different communities other than saying okay oil and gas can shove us aside and we are not going to let them shove us aside we're going to make a demand on our land but but you're saying they're not only saying that they're also saying hey <laughs> we want this kept in the soil 
And so even if you compensate us, we're not going to take the compensation. We're not going to be relocated. We're not going to be rehabilitated, you know, uh, which I find um, a very difficult argument uh, to make because what it ultimately will end up doing is that um, communities are being asked to bear the full brunt of whatever they are uh, without change, without uh, you know, this was the old argument about what Chipko did. If there is no development, if there's no uh, improvement in their lives and they should remain as they are forever, it becomes a bit harder for this argument to continue. So, I mean, the bottom line, let me just end, is this, that uh, resource curse allowed us to get into the politics of distribution. Uh, Blockadia, does not seem to offer us anything other than saying, don't do anything because we think it's more valuable under the soil. Yeah, so I'm not sure whether this is a viable uh, politics because it, it's, it, in some very bizarre way, it is like um, tradition holds, and uh, no other kind of movement uh, should be made by uh, the communities. Yeah. So, uh, frankly speaking, uh, to me, Klein's, of course, that's not her idea, but the way she talks about Blockadia, it's about these noble communities trying to sacrifice for the entire planet by, by denying themselves any kind of uh, progress or development or movement. You know, uh, so anyway, that, that's my that's my loud thought. But otherwise, fabulous, fantastic, very careful documentation. I love the fact that you use these slogans to help us think through value, and that is fantastic. I mean, uh, but but other than that, I I distribution and blockadia, the politics don't seem to um, meaningfully uh, connect for me. Thank you. I more um, or less agree with Rohan, but I think that that sometimes it's true that, the, for instance, in northern Ecuador, in Sucumbios, where the Chevron Texaco was, not only Chevron is not giving, paying back any compensation in money terms, they left a mess, isn't it? So it would have been better not even to start. And this happens quite often with mining and and with all extraction or coal extraction that the, in the long run, one can goes back and says, would be better to leave it in, even for local reasons, without thinking of climate change. But at other times people would say, no, let's take it out and distribute better the revenue, isn't it? 